the news, whether it's through the New York Times or online, it's amazing to do it. And we looked at a couple of examples of things of Blackboard, <coughs> different styles of leadership and change, and obviously Colonel Gaddafi and, uh, and Libya is providing us now with a, a different example from what we saw in Tunisia and Egypt. Little did we know when we began uh, laying out this course, we began the first meeting that we were going to have these examples coming forth from the international system. So I ask you to be particularly vigilant in watching what occurs. In today's New York Times, there are, there are two articles uh, on the op-ed page, one written by a Libyan novelist about the case of revolutionaries, and a second by the veteran journalist Nick Kristoff on what we can do to tackle the Libyan issue. And both of these articles, I think, provide you with a perspective on a country that most of you shouldn't know much about, and if you do, we haven't had much access as a country, but it's, a, it's a certainly a pivotal uh, situation. And as you can tell, looking at Libya and again at Egypt, perhaps at Bahrain or Yemen, that turn of change is taking a different course here. We have almost a classic civil war situation developing with a country that was relatively new in terms of being formed, now looking like it's splitting apart once again. What you can't see when you look at these difficulties is a level of fissure and contraction that occurs because of clan and, and tribal relationships. <clears throat> in that case, in Libya, it certainly is the case. So as you can see going on behind me here is uh, 150 years and 150 seconds, uh, thanks to the New York Times and our, and our special guest here uh, today. I want to make a special uh, um, note of thanks to a, a dear colleague of many, many years, Dr. Sarah Brown, who's here today with, with her social work class. And Sarah and I were in the social science division here uh, together uh, in, in the past. And Dudley is, is still here too. There he is right here, Dudley Brown. Very glad to have him here. And very pleased to be joined today by uh, uh, Suzanne Betts, uh, my uh, ace confidant. When I was thinking about leadership and change and the possibility of who we might be able to attract to come join us, um, I'm very pleased to tell you that everyone that we asked uh, has agreed to come. And that's, a, I think, a great testimony to the importance of the issues. Uh, there was one person that I was really hoping could join us, and uh, she's here today. Um, last week, the last time we met, we had Mayor Purdy with us. We did a phenomenal job of looking at contemporary politics and the local scene, and, and Felice Noodleman is going to take our gaze a little bit further than, uh, than our neighborhood and our community. Felice Noodleman currently serves as the Executive Director for Education with the New York Times Company. She oversees the educational initiatives of both K-12 and higher education areas, and responsible for developing global strategies, partnerships, and identifying new business opportunities. Her work has included the launch of the Epsilon uh, System, uh, where she serves as the Chief Operating Officer. She has a number of awards that I could, I could read for you. Uh, one of the areas that she is most well known for is the launch of the Times Knowledge Network, which includes a number of online initiatives for learning that I hope Felice will speak to you about. <clears throat> uh, Felice Noodleman is the godmother of the American Democracy Project. She is the individual who jump-started the colleges and universities around the country to get interested in civic engagement in a collaborative way. In fact, I think Felice Noodleman probably manifests the sense of collaboration and collaborative learning and building a community of learners about as well as anybody that I've ever met. So the 200 and some universities around the country, including Northeastern State University, that actively involve themselves in the American Democracy Project can look need look no further than our guest today to see where those ideas originally emanated. And uh, she uh, will hopefully will speak a little bit about uh, some of that uh, today uh, as well. I have had the great uh, privilege of being involved with a number of people around the world who are actively connected to creating possibilities for students and for, and for people. The opportunity to grow and develop society. And I think of, this, of that list, which is relatively formidable, way at the top, um, is our guest today. Uh, she represents the best of what we have to offer, and I've given her free reign. Uh, the topic is global leadership. I'm hoping she will talk a little bit about the work of the Times, and particularly about the notions of collaborative learning. And as you know the format, uh, our guests will have a chance to speak for some minutes, then we'll do a little cross-talk with one another at the chairs, and then it's up to you. 
We'll open this floor and she will be with us as long as she can be until her plane for New York is ready to leave. So, ladies and gentlemen, our very special guest, Felice Noodleman. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. And I, I feel that instead of talking, I should be taking the seminar from, from President Betts. Um, he's been a, just a part of our advisory, sort of what I consider my advisory group and, and part of our think tank um, in helping guide us through really looking at how we work in education. And, um, and Don's expertise in international affairs is, is really unparalleled. But I also, since um, we he spoke of Libya, I do want to also acknowledge that you have lived in Libya. And I don't know if all the students know that here. Four years. And so obviously the events that are going on in the world right now are, are touch you very deeply. And, um, and so I just wanted to, didn't want to I'm making you uncomfortable, but I do think as a resource for students to get a sense of, of, of your perspective would be invaluable. So, so just wanted to acknowledge that. It is, um, it's just wild times we live in. And when I was looking at 100, 150 years, we just happened to, it's actually a little bit more than 150 years because we updated a couple slides, but when we were looking and trying to judge um, the change that takes place in that period of time, it's interesting because for each of the decades that are marked, there's clearly change, there are inventions, there are events, there's catastrophe, there's uh, you, events on, a, on such a grand scale but on such a, a personal scale that touches many. But when, you get to the, when we were getting to the end of this and we're looking at the 2000s, and we're looking at the accelerated pace of change and events. That's when it really struck, struck us. And I started thinking about leadership and thinking in terms of what is leadership and what is there such a thing as global leadership anymore. Is change so accelerated that there's no one notion of global leadership, but there's, there's an imperative that we all become aware, astute observers, able to think critically, to do analytical reasoning, and to understand leadership frameworks to be prepared for the, for the global society that we're in and, and the enormous acceleration of change that's been taking place. I would say I don't envy you taking your place in the world at this time except I think we also can think of everything that's going on as a renaissance. And so it's the perfect time for you to step into the world and into a very global mashup society. It is a renaissance. And there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of catastrophe. There's also enormous potential for reinvention and for involvement. And so you're actually entering in and taking your place in a society that is hungry for the type of thinking that you bring, you bring to it. And I can give some examples of that. I want to, I want to give a little bit of my background so, so that you understand um, maybe why I, I'm going to pose some of the questions that I pose. And I'm, what I'm really hoping is that, that we have a dialogue today. And I'm going to try to keep these comments very brief. And if I, if I start uh, have, you know, glazing over, having you guys glaze over or bore you, please someone jump up and say, uh, snap out of it. And we'll move on to, to sort of the crosstalk and, and discussion, OK? So I. Um, before joining the Times, I spent 13, 15 years in higher education. And I was an adjunct faculty. And my background is in photography and fine arts. And that makes me eminently qualified to do nothing. <laughs> and overqualified to think about things. And so I, I feel that I'm, I might be the luckiest person in the world to have ended up where I, where I ended up. 
so, so that's just so you have a sense of, you know, there was no grand plan, and, and my background is one that really springs from a love of education and a love of learning and a love of exploration of, through philosophy of big ideas and through photography of being able to be trained. I'm trained as an artist to take an idea, take a vision, walk it through a process, and end up with a product, right? So that's my, my training, is to both think critically about ideas, try to think of big ideas, but also to be able to take one of them and actually create something from it. And when I taught, I thought my job was not only to have expertise in my subject area, but that my real focus in life was to focus on student success. And I thought that was just about the most rewarding thing that I could do. And I learned so much in my early years of teaching, right? I mean, I think one of the most important things you learn as an adjunct instructor certainly is not to leave grading homework till Sunday night. But I really learned an enormous amount and probably one of the most important things I think I learned early on that helped frame my thinking about leadership and will wrap around to sort of this global leadership was that I, under, I began to learn how easily people can come, become dis, disenfranchised when they're in a culture that's not aligned to growth and support. And that was both representative of the students and the faculty. The, the sense of disenfranchisement. And what can happen if the culture does not support their growth. And as I moved um, from faculty into administrative levels at the college where I was, I began to notice that the enterprise that I was engaged in was significantly and considerably more effective when it was aligned to a core mission and focused on creating a vibrant learning environment, an engaged environment, and graduating students who were truly engaged and ultimately contributed to the economic and social capital of the country, not just as an outcome, but as a ownership that as they were transitioning out of the institution, that they were going to contribute to the economic and social capital. And so those notions of what is a culture, what does an environment mean? What does it mean if you were a leader, which you are, right, leaders, how would you establish a culture that hopefully meant that people were not disenfranchised and that people within the culture and framework truly felt that they were con going, either contributing or going to contribute to the economic and social capital of the country where they, were, where they lived and worked, their communities. What would that look like from a leadership perspective? So where I work at the New York Times, we faced enormous disruption over the past few years. And we started to see the beginning of a disruption perhaps about um, seven, eight years ago. And we started, we had a choice at that time. We could either hunker down and hope by hunkering down it went over us, or we could face it and treat it like a renaissance. So we chose the latter. We chose to look at disruption as an opportunity to reevaluate what our core was whether it still held true, whether it was still sacrosanct, and then to blow it wide open and say that if you have a core and you have a principle that's important, what else matters? Does it matter how you deliver for us news? No. Could be print, could be digital, could be anything. But what's the core if it's not the delivery of that? Well, the core is the gathering distribution analysis of the information, right? What's your core? What's your core? What are you going to hold true to, regardless of how you approach it, your roadmap? If you think of our country, your town, your community, what's the core? What are the core values? What is a role that we're playing within a democracy? How to retain that? Now think about what's going on in the world. 
And for each of the levels of disruption that you can begin to see and laid out, can you identify the core and what the principles are? In Egypt, it's probably much easier than what's going on in Libya, right? And part of that also is maybe some of the catastrophe that, that is probably going to happen in Libya and the bloodbath that's going to happen. Is right. The leadership isn't necessarily holding on to a core that's sacrosanct versus power. So once you would determine the core, look then at what your role is as a leader to maintain and continue that going forward versus what you're doing just to maintain power. Right? And one of the things that, that we've been seeing and looking at in the New York Times and one of the things we did in assessing our own role in the world, we know we're a thought leader. Right? We know the New York Times is a thought leader. On any given day, and, a, and this is a low average day, 17 million people come to our website. Millions pick up the print product every day. Millions get it on an iPad. Millions get it through tweets. And millions more then get secondary reviews of the news that someone got on a tweet, had a thought about, passed along to someone else. Secondary, third, right? On our highest day, 62 million people came to our site in the morning. That's a leadership position. That's a thought leadership position, right? How do you separate that from a power position? How do you maintain your core without getting consumed by the power you have as a leader? All of these are questions when we think about charting our own path to the future. And they're all the type of conversations we have at the times. In, when we talk about new ideas or talk about how we move forward, you have to be cognizant of your role in society. Right? You have to be confident that you feel the power to contribute to the social and economic capital. You want to be confident that you are a thought leader, that you're able to work with others and collaborate to continue the growth of ideas and thoughts. But where's the slippery slope to trying to hold on to power. And what happens at that, mo at that point? So when we're faced with this much disruption, we can easily see that we're in the midst of a profound transformation. And you can pick up the paper, log on, talk to people, engage, and see that the struggle and difference between leadership and power are just playing out in front of us on the world stage. We see the unrest in the Middle East. You see China reemerging as a powerhouse, an increasingly globalized economy, stunning scientific and technological breakthroughs, a communications revolution that is bringing all of this into our own homes around the clock, so where will these changes lead us? What role does, revolution, does leadership play in a revolution? What role does leadership play in sustained change? What type of leadership models are emerging? What is the difference between leadership and power in these models? And is there such a thing as global leadership, or are, all, are we all required to have an increased global awareness <coughs> simply to lead. So it's thrilling, right? It's thrilling and it's daunting. And how do we move forward? You know, we, I'm, I'm going to assume that we're all agreed we don't hunker down, right? We're going to move forward. How do we do it? How do we do that? I'm going to, I guess, posit that one of the ways that we do that is through a profound sense of duty. And that in leadership, the need 
to respond to things through a sense of your duty is critical. Right? And I, and I guess, you know, but we'll talk about this cross I don't think that's what Qaddafi's doing. Mm -hmm. Right? And the question is whether those that are fermenting and, and leading some of the rebellion can sustain that sense of duty and move forward, even in the face of what's surely going to be a disaster. So the other notion that we play with the New York Times is that information is power, right? And that widely distributed knowledge is the cornerstone of a progressive and successful civilization. More simply, as human beings, we are at our best when fully informed. And as we see from the Middle East, access to information and communication tools can and do lead to change. No clearer example of the importance of being informed and the importance of communicating and collaborating through information that leads to change. So we can talk about this in any number of ways. We can consider how our institutions evolve over the next decade, the leadership skills we will need to acquire. For faculty, the new teaching strategies we will need to develop and the roles accountability, globalization, and student learning will play in our thinking about the future. And we certainly need to understand how social media are leading to new social constructs. I can't help but think that we need to pay attention to the disruptions and changes to the new ways of communicating and collaborating. We have to have an opportunity to visit anew how we teach and learn. If you look at the cause of what's this eruption in, in the Middle East, the significant class distinction, the ability for, or the, or the disenfranchisement of an entire population that could not sustain themselves economically, that were not a fully contributing and driving force in their country, right? Leads to this rebellion. And coupled with the communication tools that are, that are at their fingertips, the ability to inform others to collaborate around change. It just played out in front of our eyes in Egypt. That's not as far away as you might think it is. It's not something that's happening over there that has no relationship to us. Right? It's at the heart of how we're looking at our own lives. It's at the heart, not that, that we're in, I'm not saying that we're in the same situation, but at the heart of it is the foundation and the need for knowledge. It's a need to be a part of something, to feel like you're involved in it and you're contributing to the economic and social capital. So what does it mean for us then? If education is the foundation of this, if education provides you with the ability to, become lead, to take on leadership, if education provides you with the ability to think about how you might contribute to the economic social capital, if education provides you with the ability to actually contribute, to take what you're learning and turn it into something that will improve your own life and the life of others, what does it mean in the United States? By any various metrics, we're tied for seventh place globally. We're not the educational leader. We must do better. If we're going to continue to compete and we're going to continue to lead, right, and be a thought leader, we must focus on improving education. Our quality of life is dependent upon the ability to access knowledge and create meaning. We need to think broadly. We need to, th to consider adopting new models of education, designing new pedagogy, building stronger partnerships, and finding new ways to do everything more effectively. 
and we need to acknowledge the new social structures that are emerging. Let's learn from the disruption. I'm going to give you one example of some research we did, and that's um, one of the things that, that really struck us in terms of the education system and how students were interacting in it. We had been doing all of this in eth ethnographic and demographic study. And we had researchers actually sitting in students' homes, sitting in classrooms, watching the behaviors, and then interviewing the students. And um, we, this one student that one of our researchers interviewed, you know, he, he described his day. And he talked about his day, and it was totally, totally scheduled, every, just about every minute. And the researcher said, well, tell me about your friends. And he said, oh, my friend Mike, you know, he lives down the block. And this is in the Midwest, in a suburban area. And uh, the researcher said, oh, do you, do you see, how often do you see each other every day? Oh, you go to school together? No, we go to different schools. Are you in after school, sports, clubs? No, different. Well, how do you see each other every day? You go over his house, he comes over yours? No. Well, what are you talking about then? Well, every night and for the past year and a half, we've been logging on and we play a game. And we've been doing this for a year and a half, and the students started, the, the students started getting extremely excited about this game they were playing for, for the past year and a half. And the researcher said, well, tell me about the game. And the students said, well, we're on level six. And he was able to describe level six, he was able to, he was very articulate about the teammates, his teammates, their strengths, their weaknesses, and the skills that they learned that took them to level six. And the researcher said, well, that's exciting. So what are you looking forward to? Well, I'm looking forward to level 10. Well, why are you looking forward to level 10? Well, this student was imagining and started just imagining what he might do at level 10. What, what things there were going to be on level 10, what some of the tasks were, what he was going to do, how they were going to interact, what it was going to look like right, on level 10. And the researcher said, did something very timesy, and he said, wow, that sounds a lot like school. And there was this silence. And the student said, well, what are you talking about? And the researcher said, well, what did you learn last year? that's helped you this year? Silence. Well, what are you excited about learning? Silence and then something. So what do you think he was excited about learning? Throw out some things. What do you think he was, he, the one idea he got excited about, what was he excited about? That's it. That's it. How old was the student? Nope. Lower. Nope, lower. Lower. Eight. Eight years old. Had been playing for a year and a half. Total disconnect. And for us, that was an epiphany. Right? Fully engaged in immersive global, collaborative environment. It wasn't World Warcraft. I'm just saying that. It wasn't Doom. It was a different game that he got me sucked into. Right? Totally involved. Totally involved. Totally disconnected from our traditional education system that isolated and siloed pieces of information and knowledge and didn't as he saw it, have a connection from one thing to the other. That was three years ago. He's headed your way as an insti at, at the institution. But what does it mean? What does that mean in terms of leadership challenge? How do you engage? Not only how do we engage, but how do we turn that student into someone that's going to fully contribute in society? How do we keep him from being disenfranchised? Because if he's disenfranchised, now you'll be long out of college by the time he gets here, right? But he's going to be building your future. 
and tell me the type of person you want to help build the future. Think of it, your leaders. What type of person do you want to help you build the future? What type of person do you want to help build the future? And that's, to me, a leadership challenge. It's a decision you have to make, and what we had to make is the New York Times. Is there a role that a brand like the New York Times, a thought leader, by any measure, right? Gave you some of the statistics. Is there any role that we can play in helping to forestall or change that cycle of disenfranchisement? Is there any role that we can play to drive more to an engaged, immersive, constructive society through education. And that's been the work that we've been focused on. It's leading us to a conversation of how we ultimately define the learning environment. Because, I'll go out on a limb here, I'm not totally convinced it all happens in the classroom. I'm not convinced. And if that's the case, what does that mean? How different was the, was the, and I'm going to take a jump here, so go with me on this. How different was the call to action issued in Egypt via social network tools from Paul Revere's famous ride? Two totally different periods in time. Was Paul Revere's ride based on social networking? Yes. Why did it work? Why did that ride work? He knew the territory. He knew the territory. Why else did it work? He had contacts. He had places. contacts in the right places. Why else did it work? Right? Okay, so it, it, it was something that was resonating with everyone, ringing true. Some of the students jump in here. Why did Paul Revere's ride work? He set up a network. He set up a network. Any other reasons why it worked? A fair number of people were afraid of what was going on. Right. A fair number of people were afraid of the current status, what was going on. Why else? He was able to communicate. He communicated. Why else? Did people stay in their homes after he uh, made the ride? What'd they do? They came out and acted. Do you think there was any rehearsal or discussion, or did he just get on his horse and go? Did he know what he was supposed to do? They had a plan. They, had a plan. they definitely had a plan. And he wasn't the only one. And he wasn't the only one. Right. So there were at least one other, two other riders, right? So. Right. Let's just fill me in on Egypt. Why did that work? Suppressed, looking for a moment in time. Tools, did they have, they had the tools, right? Google, they had someone also that really knew how to communicate. Totally different types of social networking, but two moments in time where the right tools were used, the right information disseminated, and the undercurrent of dissatisfaction and disenfranchisement was being addressed. And people were ready to take action. I'm going to say that the disruption that the New York Times experienced and all news industry experienced over the past few years is a tip of the iceberg to the level of disruption that education is going to experience. Tip of the iceberg. We're seeing it, and there's a moment in time that we have to treat this like a renaissance, to stay true to the core, but to blow out the walls to engage in the creation of knowledge and meaning in new ways, to lead so that we're developing 
a country of thinkers, of dreamers, of people that want to be engaged in the enterprise and feel fulfilled by their role and by the possibilities for their future. I, I don't think it's easy, but um, I think it sure beats hunkering down. So I was going back to, um, there's a guy, David Weinberger, who's a fellow at the Harvard Law School, uh, Harvard Law School's Berkman Center for International uh, Internet and Society. And I'm going to read this because I, I don't want to get his, what he said wrong, but he made a compelling case for a new teaching method when he said, quote, the old model of learning is that knowledge is in books and individuals learn by reading those books and teachers help them extract that knowledge. But the fundamental model of how we learn and what it is to know is shifting. People are out there exploring and doing work together online. They're learning socially. They are doing more than learning. They are living the messaging. They are changing political systems. They're learning socially. This is a new global constituency. This is a new opportunity to rethink education and leadership. So how long should we continue to try learning, try to tie learning to four walls? leadership to a small isolated community. How do we expand our own way of thinking? How do we become more responsive to a global and social environment? How do we understand what the influencers are? And how do we use the right tools to create change and to influence and lead? So those are, those are sort of the questions that I've been thinking about in leadership and, um, and that we've been having discussions about at the time. So I sort of took you inside a little bit to some of the types of conversations we have. And from these types of conversations and thoughts, then we, we look at, well, so what? What is it we should be doing? Does the Times work with Al Jazeera? Do we open up a bureau there and actually co-produce? Maybe. Do we go over to, with Don Betts to Doha and look at how to bring Muslim majority nations and US institutions together to create new ways of looking at knowledge and meaning and culture? Do we look at the role of student civic engagement? Do we look at things like in Texas where we launched a program with every single K-12 teacher and every student to make seamless a community of learners and professional development that all teachers are involved with? What is it we do going forward that's going to result in new ways of engaging and creating a, an immersive environment as you, the students in this room, build the future? So that's uh, sort of what we've been thinking about. What have you guys been thinking about? Why don't you join me here and we'll, uh, we'll explore this a little bit. Thank you very much, Felice. I'm going, this for a second. I'm going to move this back because I think we're blocking our colleagues over here. So what do you guys do in your spare time at the New York Times, if that's what you, uh, <laughs> what you spend your time thinking about? In some ways, I actually would have, if I think about uh, the construct of the of the experience of the last few weeks and what we have in store for the future, probably if all things had been equal, I would ask Felice to have been here perhaps first. Uh, because in some ways, given the platform from which she works, she has a perspective that, that others may not have, not directly in education, but tremendously connected with formal education. And yet at the same time, having the platform of the New York Times and all of its interests from which to, to look out. There was a point that I recall 
when we used to use the New York Times, that it seemed um, not so connected to higher education, and particularly right. higher education beyond um, perhaps Ivy League or uh, research institutions. And that, that uh, persona and that approach certainly, certainly has, has shifted and changed. And I thank Felice and the others for opening up, almost democratizing their interest in education around the country, including institutions like Northeastern, Northeastern State University. Felice, we have a, we have a mission statement that, that is, was crafted over a period of 18 months, and it's, it's clearly aspirational. But we talk about our responsibility to empower socially responsible global leaders, our students to become that, and, to bu and we do that by building and sustaining a culture of learning. What I was hearing you say just a few moments ago seemed to me um, an opportunity for us to think more broadly and deeply about what that culture of learning might be. Could you talk a little bit? You've talked about blowing out the walls, et cetera. We speak about a culture of learning. It's not confined to right. a class or a moment or a degree. I mean, when you see this disruption globally and, and in the United States, uh, every place, it, it's, it's a phenomenon. Uh, how do you, what role do you see your education playing in terms of, of capturing the very opportunities that may develop and present themselves during right. that disruptive process? It, it's, that's interesting because one of the exercises we've done is to model out or to try to create as many different models of education as we possibly can. Okay. What are all the possible scenarios? And we mo we've modeled them out. Um, that doesn't mean they're right. But, but we try to take an idea like, what if there were no universities? Where would people go for education? And then build out what that might look like and model out. Uh, we try to, to look at, what if you could create a global classroom where students from all over uh, we're interacting with one another. What would learning look like in that scenario? And we tried that experiment we, with the Nick Kristoff seminar, okay. where we, we actually took Nick Kristoff, one of, one of our columnists, and we ran a one-week seminar, opened it up to everyone in the world, and we, had, we limited the numbers. But, but we had students, we had faculty, we had teachers, we had philanthropists, we had um, people that were leading medical NGOs in Senegal, logging on in China and Croatia and all, and all over. And we said, what if this were a global classroom? What, what if it's about a learning environment versus a classroom? What, how would you construct a learning environment? And what if, like the exercise we did at the Times, what if it wasn't about, um, when we were looking at the importance of print versus other ways of delivering news, what if the core is just news gathering, is education, is learning environment, but it didn't matter that it was in a classroom? What, what would it look like? And we did this one-week seminar. We had all these people from all over the world interacting with one another for one week, intensive forums, live chats, web, you know, all of this rich, rich interaction. And we found a couple things. The barriers or the, the distinctions between age fell away. Hmm. The, uh, the issues around culture fell away because they were focused aligned on an issue, right? Women, um, sex trafficking and reproductive rights, they were aligned on this issue. And yet what became interesting was how they were learning from one another, how they were each giving their perspective and, and, and learning. And when we were going to end the seminar after a week, the students said, wait, 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 we want to keep talking. And in this e-learning space, they created a group collaboration space. And what they did was they started a mini philanthropy and started raising money and gave for doctors that were doing fistula repair that were mentioned in the Nick's column. And so we could see that from the information that Nick was sharing with students firsthand, he's out there and he's reporting back and talking. And the information that every, and perspectives that everyone was bringing it became much greater than any one individual in that class, mm. including Nick, and that it was sustained over time. And we typically think of things as, you know, I remember I was a faculty, and I used to love when students came to visit me in my office, you know, because I thought, this is it, they're engaged. Well, all of a sudden, we could see there was no office. It was all virtual office hours, what we call. But the students kept the discussion going and were engaged and were taking it into their own lives. And so... 
I'm not saying that's the answer, but I, I think if you start with the premise of we want a learning environment and we want engaged learning and we want it to be sustained, it may not look like what we created. I'm just thinking this building um, was created uh, 12 years ago, something like that. How we might, if we were going to design it again, what we would have done. Um, many of us went to school where there was a single source of knowledge, yeah. somebody that came in and did something, and, and the rest were uh, dutifully lined up to receive. And so how many of you faculty members here have found yourselves, and students found yourselves in rooms where you say, listen, can we reconfigure these chairs? Can we kind of move these tables around so we can see each other and interact with one another? What we're trying to do is create the kind of space that encourages that kind of connection. And what's happening globally, obviously, is we've not only taken down the walls, but created new, new uh, software and new connectors that make it possible for us to do things we, we couldn't do before. I think one of the most telling remarks you've made, and we're going to open up to our friends here now, is, is that those people that are involved with education know that we are in, in, the, in, in it, we're in it, and it's going to be difficult, and it's going to be challenging. You use the word daunting, and I think that's probably the most mm -hmm. appropriate point. But it's also one of those opportunities where, like the people of Egypt in the last few weeks, when they stood up and said, we're doing this because we no longer fear, I think there's sort of a shedding of the fear of what might be next and knowing we have to move forward. Yeah. And I find among my, my colleagues, personal colleagues in the country, a whole cadre of individuals that know that what is coming is very different than what was happened before. Um, I guess in some ways it reminded me of an experience I had, and I'll stop this. I used to teach on a ship every once in a while with a bunch of faculty members, about 25 from around the, the, the country and about 500 students. And these faculty members, were most of them were very distinguished. I was at the time, I was very young. But many of them were unsuccessful mm -hmm. on the ship. And it was because the environment was simply so difficult for them to maneuver because they couldn't escape you. They couldn't escape you. It was 600 feet long and five or six decks, and we couldn't get away from you. So if you were comfortable in that environment, you created a learning opportunity that to this day might have been the best teaching I ever did. But if you weren't comfortable in that environment, it was sheer terror because you couldn't withdraw. Mm. And I think in some ways what we've said is, what we're saying is the platform for learning is wide open. We all have something to contribute. Some of us have deep knowledge. Some of us have d deep experience. But we also have passion and a sense of commitment. And I think, Felice, one of the points you raised that I really begin to focus on is we want to make the translation and the connection between the learning and the doing. Yeah. You mentioned the issue of duty between the obligations that once you know and have the pos possibility of learning how you collaborate with one another to create different outcomes. Yeah. And I think that's, in one of the ways, I think the New York Times is a leader in terms of us thinking about this uh, issue. That's, yeah, that's good. And, and then when you tie that on, so what if we were to say metaphorically and throw it open? Metaphorically, what are you waiting to learn? Are you waiting to learn how to drive? Okay, just as a metaphor. What is it that you're excited about learning? And then how are you going to focus on that? And I think this applies to faculty as well as students. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's everyone. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, that was, I could do this with you for about an hour and a half, but we're going to open the story. Uh, I'm going to call on the members of the class and guests. Please uh, we'll have Felice for a few more minutes before she has to head back to the East Coast. Um, open up to any questions, comments, uh, ideas that you might want to share with her. Um, she might be able to stay for a couple minutes if you want to do okay. some one-on-one, -on -one, but she does have to be on her way. Floor is open. This gentleman. Um, you know, gen eds, a concept like that. Do you, what do you think about having certain students just forgetting learning about it and just the whole picture and just focusing on one area? Mm. What do you think about that? Like, why, why do I have to learn about math if I want to be an artist? Or, you know what I mean? I, right. I know everything's related, but I don't know. I, you know, I thought the same thing when I was uh, in college to the point where I didn't take math. And, um, <laughs> and my philosophy, my mentor, my philosophy professor, my advisor, got the chair of the math department to agree to give me an independent study in ornithology, which was the head of the math department um, was an ornithologist, you know, it was his hobby. 
and my philosophy professor convinced him that I also loved the our our winged friends and would he just but I but I was a senior and the only pesky issue was that I had to take that math requirement and if he would just waive that I would do an independent study in ornithology with him um, and so then fast forward to why do you have to study math and I'm going to say that it's not about the formulas are not about the fact that you know you know what a hypotenuse is or, or just calculus but I'm asked to think on any given day mathematically and I'm asked to think philosophically and I'm asked to think from all these multiple perspectives and the more I grow and the more of a leadership position I take, the more I'm asked to instantly move between disciplines. And so it's not that I know how to do an equation, right? Because we have so many tools now that can do all the equations for us. But it's that I know frameworks of thought. And I would say, take math, even if you fail. Take math. Take physics. You know, experience as many different frameworks of thought as you possibly can because you might pull on them and you might pull on them in really creative ways that aren't tied to how you know calculus or something. So I do think you need to dive deep, but I think you need to dive deep into the things that are your passion. Um, but I think it helps to have a, a broad perspective to bring. But that's, that's just me. So, uh, you and then you. So. <laughs> Okay, my question is um, it's a little more broad in the country itself. With our generation moving in to take in, you know, what is your generation's current leadership positions, there is a large difference between our learning styles. The traditional learning style, what you guys learn and what we learn and the way we learn things are very different now, and I think that causes a lot of conflict with this transition period. What do you think education can do to help maybe save us from such the conflict of transition with the next generation when we're the ones that have to give up our positions to them. Mm. Wow. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a, we call that sticks at the New York Times when we asked a difficult question, we punt it right back to you. We sorry, sorry. Sticks, no. um, I, one, I, th I think there's something about being graceful in transition. And um, I have an intern now whose uh, major is in organizational psychology. And, um, and I'm help asking her to help me think about education. And her style is, is it is, it's, it's very different. Uh, and we have a, a whole group of, at the times that are coming in that are, that are really different. There are some things that are really good about it. And, and one is, the appreciation of the lim of recognizing the limits of yourself and not being threatened by others that are coming in that might be brighter, stronger, faster, different, and that in fact is what you'd hope for, right? Because if they were stupid and slow and boring and just agreed, I mean, I would be really, really, really worried and f and angry at it at the educational system. Instead, I'm hopeful. The one thing I worry about that I see, and we talked this about at lunch, is that the gen we're seeing a whole generation of people that are just reactionary, that take any information that comes over the transom, over the doorstep, and accepts it as credible. And that's unnerving, because you may get a tweet, or you may see a blog, or you may see something, or watch Fox, or watch any outrageous thing and treat it as a credible news source rather than opinion. And the thing that worries us a bit, worries me, is the ability that you to, to discern between different ways and styles. So good and bad. So I think that in any transition you want to recognize what the strengths uh, people are bringing but also some of the, some of the challenges and try to try to help un bridge that understanding so does that did I answer okay that's good okay well, I'll take one more yeah you talked about the core and 
I'd like for you to elaborate on that. And I know the time is a factor. Also, I'd like to ask, have you ever had agencies or people try to censor you or to put out uh, information that's untrue? Have you had pressure like that in your newspaper? Oh. Yeah. So on the, on the paper, on the front page, it says, without fear or f all the news that's fit to print. And what, what's instilled in all of us in the newsroom, right? But even on the business side, what's instilled is without fear or favor. Without fear or favor. You cannot be afraid of challenging. So, so yeah, there have been instances where I know the publisher was called to the, to the White House. And his mom, the first time he was called, there's a story, he was called and he went, you know, I went to the White House, I went, I sat in the Oval Office with the president, all excited. He's a young, young guy and his mom said, what do they want from you? What do they want from you? You're always aware of stuff like that, right? I'm going to go back to um, what's core. I, I think what's core is the creation of knowledge and meaning. Being true to yourself. I think that the ability to create knowledge and meaning requires some level of truth to yourself. Sir. One more question and we're going to have to close down. Anything else you'd like to ask? Yes. Um, and this is kind of a broader question as well. Coming from a house of clergy, we find that people will come and tell us, you know, why did our kids end up the way they are? And we combat that with, um, you know, we only spend so many hours a day with them. Do you think that maybe we should start pushing towards more education in the home? Because that's the other half of where students are spending their time. Mm. I, I think we should push for more education everywhere. I think, again, if you take away the word education and look at the creation of knowledge and meaning, and the world around us begs for us to create meaning out of it. Right? It's what we do. We try to make sense out of, out of something. We try to make a narrative around it. We try to understand it. We try to go as deep as we can with these things. And so I think there are so many opportunities always to try to create knowledge and meaning, whether it's the home, whether it's the soccer field, whether it's coming out of a movie with friends and, and, you know, and talking about the movie. I, I think there are so many, so many instances where that's true. I think the most difficult thing then right, is doing what we need to do for that eight-year-old student, which is not to isolate each of those instances, but to try to grapple with how they fit together, you know, how you weave all of this together into, and make sense. So. Well, this hour has, uh, has flown by, and I really appreciate um, Felice uh, weaving us into her schedule. If I told you where she was going to go in the next week and a half, and how she's going to be all over this country or off to, off to other countries. Uh, earlier on, she talked about um, that this, in my, my terminology, that this is, could be the new Renaissance. And there's something interesting about the Renaissance that no, people didn't know it was the Renaissance when it began. Right. But they knew that it was different. And they knew that things were changing. And also, it was terribly disruptive. We're in a Renaissance sort of on hyperdrive yeah. in that we're collapsing hundreds of years or dozens of years or decades into a very small space. And we're being aided by a kind of technology which is actually more in the hands of, of those that don't create the knowledge on a daily basis, particularly younger people which are much more comfortable with the technology. So I think a perfect scenario for collaboration is a collaboration of the awareness of the technology and the use of it with the awareness of experience and understanding of a variety of disciplines finding one another and creating a new source of knowledge and opportunity, as you said, new knowledge and meeting. Why don't you help me thank Felice for coming. Thanks. Thank you.